So good afternoon. I'm Anne Rosser, I'm the current chair of Guarantors of Brain, and I'd like to welcome you to the final event of this year's Brain Conference, which is a public lecture given by Gina Poe. So it's a huge pleasure to introduce Gina, who's an American neuroscientist specializing in sleep. Um, Gina grew up in California and studied human biology at Stanford. And in 2016, she was appointed as full professor in the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology at UCLA. Gina undertook her PhD in sleep. And since then, she's published extensively in this area, in particular on the relationship of sleep to memory impairment, on its effect um, on mental health disturbances such as PTSD, and its relationship to neurodegeneration. She's also contributed in many other ways in this area, such as helping to pioneer technological solutions to recording brain activity, such as the use of coherent fiber optic imaging. And she was even involved in exploring the effects of weightlessness in space on hippocampal coding. So Gina, it's a, a great honor for us that you've agreed to give the final lecture of this year's Brain Conference. And we look forward very much to hearing about sleep and your brain. And just before we start, could I just encourage the attendees, please don't forget to post your questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosser. I appreciate the invitation to be here. The honor is all mine and it's great to see all of you. I'm glad you're here. Um, I hope that this will be a fun ride. This is my laboratory. I wanted to thank them for hanging in with me throughout the uh, pandemic. Um, this is how it stands currently. And so why do we all have to sleep and must we all sleep? Um, the answer is apparently yes, we must all sleep even when it's inconvenient, even when it's unsafe, we have to sleep or we die. We all sleep from whales to worms. And even the brainless jellyfish um, has a sleep wakefulness cycle that is homeostatically regulated. In other words, if you deprive a jellyfish of sleep um, by, for example, giving it a jet of water that wakes it up out of its sleeping state, right now it's pulsing slowly in a sleep. If you give it a jet of water that wakes it up, it will wake up, pulse more quickly, and then quickly try and get back into a sleep mode there at the bottom of the tank. And if you do that enough, the next day it will sleep during the daytime, trying to make up for all that lost sleep. It responds to caffeine, just like we do. And uh, so this is the pulse rate during the day, and this is the pulse rate of the jellyfish at night. These are beautiful studies at Caltech. Um, at night, this is a supplemental figure. You also see a second state of sleep where it's not pulsing at all for 20 seconds at a time. And this might be akin to our second state of sleep, which is called REM sleep, the dream state, rapid eye movement sleep. Of course, jellyfish don't have rapid eye movement. They don't have eyes, but they do have atonia during sleep, just like we have. Atonia is when our muscles are actively inhibited so that we don't act out our dreams. So it might be that this jellyfish is dreaming. Lord knows what it's dreaming of. But yes, it is necessary. And if we get too little sleep, we will... Um, try to do whatever we can to make sure we get what we need. This is um, necessity being the mother of invention. Uh, someone has invented a tripod so that she could sleep standing up. Here are some stickers you can put on your eyelids so you could be asleep at your computer and not have your coworkers even know about it. Um, so what happens in the various stages of sleep? Uh, this is a Fitbit um, uh, recording from my sister-in-law, Sandy, it's just almost perfect. You can see the deep slow waves of deep slow wave sleep, that waves of electrical activity that sweep from the front to back. Um, and we move into the transition to REM sleep right here when we have sleep spindles that occur. They're about one and a half second long blips of activity you can see throughout the cortex. And uh, this state of N2 sleep, it's called, um, was so transitory and transitional that people sort of ignored it for many, many decades. Um, and we didn't know what sleep spindles were for, but the past 
10 years or so, we realized that they're really important um, for learning and memory, that you have to increase your density of sleep spindles in this state of sleep in order to consolidate the things that you learned during the daytime. And then we go into our rapid eye movement state where we are dreaming. And in our memory structures, the hippocampus and its related structures, there's also an electrical pattern of activity called theta, which is five to 10 Hertz in rhythm. And um, we don't know why we have theta during wakefulness when we're learning. And then we have it again, really steadily and beautifully during rapid eye movement sleep. And um, until again, about 10 or 20 years ago, we had really no idea. Um, when I came into this field, we had no idea what this theta was for. Um, and so I point out these three rhythms because I wanna just talk a little bit more about all of them in terms of its functions. What are we doing when we sleep? Well, I liken it to cleaning up after a waking party. So um, when we're awake, all kinds of things are coming in. We're making new associations. It's kind of like having a housewarming party where people are bringing gifts and you're unwrapping them and there's trash and there's plates and there are after the party, there's just a lot a lot to clean up. And um, when you're asleep, you need to figure out what things you need to throw out and what things you need to keep or, or recycle. And so we definitely throw out the trash in our deep stage of slow wave sleep. Um, this is when those big slow waves are sweeping from front to back. Whenever your neurons are all active, that's the peak of the slow wave when they're all silent together. That's the trough of the slow wave. And um, that activity swells and shrinks the extracellular space that allows us to squeeze out or pump out the debris that builds up over our waking period. Um, and that happens through what was newly discovered to be our brain's lymphatic system. It pumps out that garbage um, while we're in that deep slow wave st sleep state. Um, so we um, do know from these beautiful papers that this happens. Unfortunately, the depth and size of these slow waves decreases as we get older. So it might be that our brain becomes less and less efficient at throwing out the garbage. And that might be one of the things that underlies um, the problems we have with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias as we get older. Um, also, there's renovation and construction that happens in, in our deep state of sleep. Growth hormone is released in a big bolus and um, things are fixed that were sort of destroyed by that waking party. Um, when that growth hormone is released in a big bolus during slow wave sleep, we also seem to be building proteins uh, and repairing our brain. So this is slow wave sleep. This is an old paper from the 1980s that shows the incorporation of a radioactively labeled amino acid, part of our protein system that incorporates them a lot during slow wave sleep and hardly at all during waking or that dream state of sleep. So that seems to be really an important thing that happens probably throughout our bodies, not just our brains. Um, so that's uh, what we like in that. Now, we can also restock our, stock our energy stores in this deep state of sleep. The longer we're awake, the more the energy packet, which is ATP, gets broken down into adenosine. And adenosine builds up and up the longer we're awake. And as soon as we fall asleep, that adenosine level gets restored back to baseline levels very, very quickly. And there's some great studies by these people here um, in favor of this idea. So we restock our energy stores. Interestingly, caffeine is a blocker of the adenosine receptor. So our brains, what it does is it masks our sleepiness um, signal for our brain. It doesn't actually help us convert adenosine back to ATP like, it, like sleep does. It just makes our brain think that we have had that restoration process. Um, so what I'm gonna concentrate on today is the, how we integrate new items into our brains. Um, there's new gifts that our housewarming guests have, have brought us during that N2 stage of sleep with sleep spindles and during REM sleep. And we consolidate our memories and we can dream up new solutions. Um, many people wake up after a good night's sleep with uh, the answer to something they've been puzzling on. And that um, happens because of these electrical waves and the neurochemical environment that happens during sleep. So we do know that memories are consolidated from um, the hippocampus, which is in the temporal lobe right about here, to the neocortex um, during sleep. And then um, this hippocampus, which is a rapid associative learning structure, important for learning new things and putting new things together, 
gets to be cleared once the consolidation is happening. It gets to be cleared and that clearing process happens specifically during REM sleep and specifically for memories that have been consolidated and written out into the long-term memory store of the distributed neocortex. Um, and that helps us avoid a saturation of this short-term memory structure, which you can think of as like a, a little thumb drive, right? It's, it's small, it's powerful, you can bring it around with you all day long, and then at night you can plug in that thumb drive to, be, um, to write the memory to long-term RAM of our, of our brain, so an analogy. So interestingly, that theta activity that I talked about that happens during that dream state, that is really sets up the brain for learning uh, when we're awake and then during REM sleep uniquely to be able to erase that thumb drive to refresh it so that the next day we can go out and learn new things. So when we're awake, um, there's activity at the peaks of theta, which is um, helps us to rapidly learn about things and bring them together. And then during REM sleep or in these papers in a REM-like neurochemical environment of a slice in the brain, when you don't have a couple of neurotransmitters that are off during REM sleep, you can get actually um, the erasure and the weakening of memories um, through activity, unique activity at the troughs of theta. So, um, so here's the neurochemical environment I was talking about. When we're awake and we're learning, we get this theta activity in our learning and memory structures. And that comes from lots of acetylcholine, which is a, um, you can think of it as a neurotransmitter of um, arousal, wakefulness, attention. Uh, and so it's high during wakefulness when we're, uh, hopefully it's high in your brains right now as you're trying to listen to me and learn about all of this. Um, interestingly, also, I said before, the theta is high during REM sleep. It's even higher and bigger in amplitude during REM sleep when acetylcholine system comes back on, you know, really, really strongly. It's uniquely absent during that slow wave bilge pump state of sleep. Um, and that is really key to the ability to generate those slow waves. In fact, in animals that have unihemispheric sleep, in other words, one side of their brain is uh, asleep while the other side is awake. And that happens in um, mammals at sea, like dolphins and whales. The only thing that changes between those two hemispheres, the one that's asleep and the one that's awake is how much acetylcholine is there. So the sleeping part, half of the brain has no acetylcholine and big slow waves and the awake part has lots of acetylcholine and no slow waves. Um, the, uh, so then there's norepinephrine is another neurotransmitter system that is on and helping us learn when we're awake and uniquely off during REM sleep and some somewhat off during that transition to REM sleep state as is serotonin. It follows the same pattern. I hope to be able to mention to you today why that's important. But when these two neurotransmitters are very low, all three neurotransmitters are low, that's what sets up those sleep spindles that I talked about earlier that seem to be able to write memories from the hippocampus to the cortex. And it, um, when acetylcholine is back on, but the, these neurotransmitters are really low, you get that big, beautiful theta. And I'm gonna talk in a moment about the importance of the norepinephrine system being off. So here is the norepinephrine system. Norepinephrine is like adrenaline it's also called noradrenaline. It's a you know, hormone of stress and um, rapid learning, um, quick thinking. And um, it comes from the locus cerulis, which is also the Latin word for blue spot. And it looks blue in stains. And, um, and it projects all over the brain, the cerebellum, the hippocampus, which is that rapid learning and memory structure, the neocortex. It projects all over the place. And um, and it does so in a modular fashion. You can see different neurons in the locus realis projected different areas. And um, it is uniquely off during REM sleep, like I talked about before. And there, it's off for fairly long periods of time during that N2 stage, which we call transition to REM sleep. But it's active, quite active when we're awake and active in bursts and pauses when we're in slow wave sleep. It's actually active. Um, prior to every slow wave. Um, and I'm gonna talk about why that might be. So here is the firing rate of those locus realis cells delivering norepinephrine all over the brain during wakefulness, a little slower in slow wave sleep, and then very inactive during that transition to REM, N2 state and REM sleep. 
All right. So, um, yes, we already have a great question, and I'm definitely going to uh, address it. So, thank you, Bradley. Uh, so, what norepinephrine does when it is present is it occupies receptors on neuronal cell membranes called beta adrenergic receptors. And it causes a cascade of events inside the neuron that effectively blocks the weakening of memories. It allows only strengthening of memories and blocks the weakening of memories. So whenever we're awake, we can only take in new information. We can never flush out old information. Um, you know, interference learning is something that's different. It's um, uh, we don't fully understand what that is, but it's not the flushing out and the selective pruning of um, information that's already, for example, been consolidated and no longer necessary to be held in the hippocampus. Um, so, uh, so I talked a little bit about theta peak versus theta trough activity, long-term potentiation, which is the strengthening of um, connections between neurons, which is the building block for learning, and depotentiation, which is the thing that allows us to weaken um, connections and erase that temporary storehouse place. It's called depotentiation. You can see each neuron, every one of these red dots is a synapse. It's covered with synapses. And if through a lifetime of learning, all we can do is strengthen these synapses, more and more and more, you can imagine that any one incoming input would cause the cell to fire, and that would cause all the cells it's connected with to fire, and so on and so forth, and you would just have white noise in the whole brain. So you really need a selective strengthening and weakening in any one memory circuit in order to selectively be able to remember one thing instead of your whole brain firing at the same time. Um, so uh, I talked about sleep spindles. Here's what they look like in our EEG that comes from um, our brain, our electrical activity. You can see that um, you're going along in beautiful slow wave or N2 stage sleep. Here's a sleep spindle that occurs. It only lasts a second or a second and a half. And the locus surrealis is silent prior to that entire um, sleep spindle and then fires up rapidly at the end to end that sleep spindle. Um, so it's silence prior to each sleep spindle is, is important for being able to set up the spindle. If it's present, you don't get sleep spindles. Um, so you really need those silences for sleep spindles to happen. And then um, interestingly, this kind of rapid fire thing that ends the sleep spindle and might help write that, that memory into the, into the cortex. Um, so, the really cool thing about sleep spindles is that this is a unique time when the hippocampus, that short-term learning and memory structure, is connected well with the neocortex. The neocortex, especially the prefrontal cortex, the judgment and decision-making area, is off uh, metabolically really low activity throughout sleep, except during sleep spindles. So when the hippocampus is firing and reactivating those memories, those things that we've learned during the day, the prefrontal cortex is uniquely active, reactive to it. It reverberates to that activity from the hippocampus in a sleep spindle fashion. So this frequency of this firing and firing again is at that frequency of 10 to 15 hertz spindle that we saw before. And you can see the amplitude of the spindle is correlated with the number of cells that are firing in the hippocampus, reactivating those memories. All right, so, uh, okay. So, um, so the two things I talked about was sleep spindles and REM sleep theta, and REM sleep theta being the unique time when you can have firing at theta troughs to depotentiate if there's no norepinephrine present, spindles being a unique time to write those memories to the neocortex. And so what normally I think happens when we learn something new, um, you can incorporate that new information into your old schema via sleep spindles. And then with REM theta trough firing in the absence of norepinephrine during REM sleep, you can get depotentiation of the old memories that are either redundant or irrelevant or wrong. And that's a really important way to help to update our memories and our knowledge of the world without confusion. So if you don't have good sleep, um, for example, if you don't have good REM sleep or good transition to REM sleep, that happens a lot when um, we're taking a, some of the sleeping pills, you don't have good REM sleep or theta uh, um, or transition to REM. It happens when we're sick 
when we're ill, we um, have much more slow wave sleep and hardly any REM sleep or that transition to REM N2 stage. Um, it happens in people with schizophrenia. They don't have good sleep spindles in their N2 state. Um, you imagine that there might be flawed incorporation of that new information into our schema. It's not incorporated into the schema in a, in a coherent fashion. And if you have too much norepinephrine, too much locus ceruleus firing throughout that REM sleep period and the transition to REM sleep, first of all, you won't get sleep spindles in the transition to REM sleep if your locus ceruleus is firing. And secondly, um, if you even if you do have good REM sleep, if the locus ceruleus is still firing, you can't get the erasure. You can't get depotentiation because remember when it's active at the receptors, it does not allow depotentiation to occur. And so instead, if you're reactivating a memory, even in the hippocampus where you should be erasing it once it's consolidated, it gets reinforced. You can imagine that would be a lot of trouble in cases like post-traumatic stress disorder when you um, come back into a safety environment after learning, after having a trauma, or it's a, you know, the war has ended, uh, which I hope happens really soon in the Ukraine, um, you can then associate, newly associate the context of safety and de depotentiate, um, downscale the old traumatic memories so that you can now, um, you know, adapt to the new reality. And that um, there is a lot of evidence that norepinephrine doesn't uh, reduce in the brain during REM sleep in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, that stress relevant um, locus realis just keeps on firing throughout REM sleep. Um, all right, so the functions of sleep we've gone through so far, slow wave sleep clears the garbage, restores the, our brain, protein synthesis builds things that need to be built. And um, that happens through the lymphatic system, um, restoring the energy stores, adenosine to ATP, which is an energy packet our, our whole body uses, and through protein synthesis. And then during that transition to REM, N2 stage of sleep, we can integrate and consolidate things from the short-term to long-term memory structures through those sleep spindles, transferring that information out to the cortex. And then during REM sleep, we can clean what no longer needs to be held in our memory structures um, through that theta trough firing. And we can also, there's a lot of activity that goes on in REM. Uh, we can sort of put new things together. There's a lot of plasticity that happens during REM sleep. Our dreams are probably not just passive events. In fact, they are probably active at changing our minds. So here are the cycles of sleep. We go from behaving, conscious waking, to slow wave sleep, to, and through the transition to REM with sleep spindles to REM sleep, where we have our active dreams. We have lots of emotions going on during that time where we are, our muscles are atonic, actively inhibited, so we don't act out our dreams. And we go back and forth um, through these non-REM and REM stages. Um, when REM sleep is doing building up more trash because there's a lot of stuff going on that slow wave sleep probably needs to clean and put away. And you go back and forth until the process of consolidation and other things are, are done and you wake up. Um, and so this cycle, the cyclicity of sleep seems to also be really important. And I liken it to um, a washing machine. If you um, there's a particular you know, order of the things that have to happen when you're cleaning your clothes, otherwise your clothes won't be clean and they won't be rinsed and they won't be dry enough to um, at least pop into the dryer and wear. Um, if you wake up out of you know, stage two or stage three sleep, you feel really bad and it's kind of like you know, trying to put your clothes on that are soaking wet with soap in them, right? Um, there's things that have to, have to happen in an, in an orderly fashion. And if you don't, if, for example, if you don't get enough sleep, all of the different sleep stages are vying for the same period of time and they start overlapping and you get all kinds of crazy things happening like um, night terrors where your emotional system that's active during REM sleep um, is, is active at the same time when you're in slow wave sleep and you don't have atonia. So you're crying out during the time. It's terrifying for parents to hear their child moaning and crying in sleep, but they're well asleep. You know, they're not sensing, they're not conscious of that um, crying out. It's just bad for the parents. Um, or if you uh, have atonia, but you're awake, um, then you have cataplexy and it's not good because you then fall down, um, you know, paralyzed, but you're awake. Or you can have confusional arousals, 
or um, sleepwalking and talking, which is a slow wave sleep combination. Some areas of the brain are in slow wave sleep, some are conscious and waking and allow, allowing you to do um, behaviors or REM behavior disorder, which is even more dangerous when you're acting out sometimes violent dreams and um, people have been known to hurt themselves very, very badly in those um, states. So what happens when we don't get enough? Well, we have all those dissociated states in sleep, but also um, it's good for the emotional system because when we don't get enough, I don't know about you, I don't know whose child this is um, or how old they are or where they are now, might be one of you in the audience <laughs> right now, but I feel the same way, cranky and short-tempered. Um, and also there've been lots of good studies lately to show that, that we are more anxious, more depressed, um, more angry, more volatile if we don't get enough good sleep. Um, and all of these other things are true. I also get hungry for junk food. Interesting, our thermoregulatory system gets messed up. It's one of the first things that happens to me when I know I've stayed up too late is I get very, very cold. Um, and then this one is really interesting. I just want to point it out. We're prone to infection um, and uh, illness if we don't get enough sleep. And even vaccines don't work. They're 50% as effective if you deprive yourself of sleep the night after you receive a vaccination. So keep that in mind as you get your boosters um, for COVID-19, get good sleep, try and get some good night's sleep right after you get vaccinated. So it's good for the immune system too. So, you know, all of these things that I've been talking about, you know, forming new synapses, breaking apart ones that don't not, no longer need to be there happens really, really fast um, when we're <laughs> When we're developing, when we're infants, doing things, learning how to walk and talk. This is a baby's first step. I mean, amazing, right? I mean, there's so much that we have to learn and do in order to be able to walk in the first place. And those sleep spindles that I talked about and that rapid eye movement state is super abundant in the very young child that's trying to learn all of these new things about its, about its world. REM sleep is the majority state when we're first born um, and, and trying to schematize your world. Um, and uh, that reduces over time as does slow wave sleep, um, but that builds up and, and grows in, in childhood, um, grows over time. We did a public, uh, published a paper um, just two years ago um, in Science Advances that shows that our early first three years of sleep seem to really follow that brain maturation process. So the amount of REM sleep follows brain maturation. And then at three years, a kind of critical time after three years, our function of sleep or the you know, correlation between sleep and processes seems to switch to sort of a maintenance brain cleaning um, state with that bilge pump of slow wave sleep. All right, so, oh, this is my, sorry, I'm gonna play this because this is my nephew, Gio, his first steps. Yay! Good. Yay, Gio. <laughs> All right, so um, who has both REM and non-REM sleep? Well, we talked a little bit about jellyfish um, possibly having two states. It seems to be true from, from dragon lizards to drosophila, even drosophila that don't have our eyes that can rapidly move, have the bits of twitching that you can see dogs and cats also doing um, when they're in REM sleep as the motor um, pattern sort of overcomes that active inhibition. So even drosophila seem to have that. Um, birds do giraffes. I put the giraffe here because it has the least amount of REM sleep of any mammal. And you can imagine that if you're at, your muscles are actively inhibited, what they have to do to get into that state is lay that long neck down in the grass, which makes them very, very vulnerable. If you've ever seen a giraffe trying to get up um, from a laying down position. And, uh, you know, again, it's a homeostatic imperative. And um, so, yeah, I, um, this is the Cassiopeia sleeping uh, and and how it also has this kind of period of atonia. Um, so uh, let's see, I've already talked about these things and what each state seems to do. So, um, so I'll just say, sort of wrap up with, is all sleep the same? Is it interrupted? Is it continuous? Um, and if it's interrupted, if we're trying to take cat naps on a, on a train, this is a, a picture taken in Japan where you can find 60 to 90% of the people on the train trying to catch some Zs. Um, 
you will um, you will see lots of people trying to get sleep. So here is a video. I mean, a, a graph of a physician um, on call, and uh, every time his pager or her pager went off, you can see the sleep they were trying to get in the in the call room is interrupted as they have to go answer um, the pager. And so you can see that they are getting some sleep, but it is quite interrupted as compared to a normal night's sleep. So what does that do? Um, we don't really know, but we do know med medical errors go way up, you know, after a night of uh, of of this kind of uh, event. And um, we're talking about serious med medical errors sometimes, getting charts mixed up or sticking oneself with the needle um, as you become less coordinated after such a night. So, um, so it's really not good. And there are other things that disturb our sleep too, like um, you know, iPhones and uh, or and um, uh, other devices that cause too much of the blue arousing light to go into our system and um, keep us awake too long. Here's the late 50s, the light pollution in the United States versus you know 20, what is projected to be in 2025 light pollution. It's just um, not good to have all that light flooding into our brains at night when, when it, what it does is it disrupts our circadian system, which helps us time our sleep. Also, if you've got sleep apnea, now that's a case when um, one of the, that your airway gets blocked as your muscles relax in sleep. And here's a picture of one's tongue falling back and closing the airway. So even though your diaphragm is trying to pull air in through your nose like it normally would, the airway is just blocked. And um, that happens increasingly as we get older as well, because our muscles get weaker and weaker as we get older after age 50. Um, and uh, so it happens to us as we get older and older, or if we are um, obese, there's a lot more tissue here helping block the airway. And the people with obstructive sleep apnea, to even be diagnosed with it, you have to at least arouse five times an hour. Five times an hour is a lot. So what they have to do to breathe again is to wake up a little and restore that muscle tone. And then they can... <laughs> breathe. And so if you ever hurt anyone, if you have a bed partner or you yourself might have sleep apnea, definitely go to a doctor and get seen about it because um, a mild case of sleep apnea is arousing 17 times in an hour in order to wake up to breathe. And that might do just terrible things to the continuity of sleep that I was talking about earlier. So what about sleep drugs? Well, there are different classes of drugs and we do definitely know that some of them like benzodiazepine type drugs um, are good at putting you into slow wave sleep, but we don't know what they do to the timing of the locus realis activity in relation to slow waves or what, and we do know that the sleep spindles and REM sleep are suppressed in with benzodiazepines. So you might want to think twice about your selection of a sleep aids. Um, some of these other ones like Z drugs don't disturb those things as much, but we still don't know what's going on in the brainstem with the locus cerulis and the serotonergic system and the cholinergic system. So it definitely re needs a lot more research into which ones. I have a stack of pancakes here because um, my neighbor used to take uh, one of these benzodiazepines and she would wake up in the morning um, after having felt great after a good night's sleep. And she would see that in the middle of the night, she'd gotten up to make <laughs> pancakes. And, you know, I mean, while she was asleep and unconscious, it's, it's, um, it's probably one of those dissociated states that I talked about earlier. And then what does caffeine do? You know, one of our favorite drugs, it actually just blocks the adenosine uh, receptors, like I talked about before. Um, it doesn't actually restore your brain's energy. It just makes you think that it's restored. So, um, so try, I would say, and avoid it and just take a cat nap instead when the 20 minutes is long enough to restore ATP. Um, so anyway, I just hope you, I've impressed upon you today that sleep is not a passive time. There's a lot of important stuff going on. Um, your brain is working really hard. You're not being lazy when you're sleeping at all. In fact, you're doing all kinds of creative and important um, functions for your not only your brain, but your whole body. So I hope that tonight you guys get a great night's sleep, sweet dreams. Thanks to the funding that has funded my laboratory over the past 22 years. And thank you to my laboratory who hung with me throughout the pandemic. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to take your questions now.
you know, thank you so much. That was a beautiful talk, exceptionally clear and insightful. Um, and we've already got a lot of questions coming through the chat. So perhaps we could start with um, Barry Stradlin, who's asked, um, uh, he's, he's a traumatic brain injury survivor. Um, uh, his sleep's been poor. He wakes, can't get back to sleep. Is this rectifiable? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, Barry, unfortunately, we don't know enough about it. And, uh, you know, I would recommend to you to go to a sleep doctor and see what they can help you with, um, whether it's through one of these sleep medications or melatonin or, um, or maybe there are ways you can uh, calm your own noradrenergic system down through meditation and a bedtime routine, but it sounds like you can go to sleep, but then you wake up again and can't get back to sleep. I think, you know, given all the things, the important functions of sleep, it would be, I think, worth your while to, to give various things uh, a try. Um, so is it rectifiable? Unfortunately, we don't know enough about traumatic brain injury. And um, it might be that in different people, it works, you know, different things are injured. And so it might be different from, for you than other people, but there are some good people that are working on that right now. And, um, and so there is hope for the future. Hang in there, Barry. Thanks, Gina. So we've got another question here, and I should say we've got um, 100 people in the room and 80 listening live on YouTube, so we've got a mixture of, of questions. Um, does the area uh, where your brain is injured have specific effects on your ability to sleep? Yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's a related question actually to what we were just talking about with traumatic brain injury. Um, so uh, is this the one from, or I, I won't see it in the chat here? Uh, it is in the chat, I don't know who it's from. Okay. Yes. So um, the question again was different areas of the brain. Yes, I think I think it's asking whether uh, brain injury in different areas of the brain have differential effects. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, if you have a stroke, for example, in the brainstem, if you survive that, because that's a hard place to have a stroke, um, you could definitely affect, for example, your ability to inhibit your muscles while you're while you're dreaming. So you could have REM sleep without atonia. Or you can make it so that you never remember your dreams. Um, so that's that's also it's not a problem necessarily uh, as long as you're getting good REM sleep. Um, definitely could. So there are different areas of the brain that sort of be are there executors of different features of sleep. Like I talked about the locus realis needing to be silent in order to set up sleep spindles um, and uh, big beautiful juicy theta, and uh, so. Those those are coming from the locus realis, and if you have a tiny lesion in the locus realis or in the thalamus, you could you could um, could definitely impair. One of the problems with schizophrenia that I mentioned before is that um, people that have schizophrenia don't have good sleep spindles, and that could be a problem in the thalamus specifically, um, because the thalamus sets up those sleep spindles through the cortex. So. Um, so the only one of the strongest genetic links with schizophrenia is a, a, a type of receptor that's a calcium receptor that helps set up sleep spindles. Um, also, there's a this condition called fatal familial insomnia. Thankfully, not that many people have it in the world, but that is also a thalamus problem, uh, part of the hypothalamus um, and thalamus that sets up slow wave sleep in the first place degenerates um, and when that happens, people, are, despite feeling terribly sleepy, can actually not generate um, anything more. They doze off and then they wake up. So it's um, it's a terrible condition and leads to death in a matter of months. Um, so yes, the answer to that, long answer to that, is, and the short answer is yes. So thank you. So the, there are two questions on sleep spindles. One, does it lead to um, poor memory over the long term if you have a lack of sleep, sleep spindles? And second, is there anything we can do to increase our chances of having good sleep spindles? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. And there are people working on it. Um, 
So one of the things that can help you have more sleep spindles and also longer REM sleep periods or more dense REM periods is kind of um, random loud sounds. But having said that, I don't necessarily recommend that you, you know, um, play random loud sounds while you're asleep uh, because they will wake you up out of slow wave sleep um, instead, of, um, instead of increasing sleep spindles. And also we don't know whether the sleep spindles you can get with ra random loud sounds in N2 sleep are um, doing the same thing. Are they having this serving the same function. So we still need to do more studies to whether that that's helpful for um, learning and memory or whether there is, uh, it arouses part of your brain and actually sort of negates the whole effect that sleep spindles could have. Similarly, loud sounds during rapid eye movement sleep can increase the density of rapid eye movements and or the length of your REM sleep. And if you time it just right, it could increase your consolidation of the thing that you learned the the, in the daytime waking period just before. But what it might do, and we don't know the answer to this yet, is it might prevent us from depotentiating and erasing that you know, REM structure of our hippocampus. And so even though we can quickly consolidate the thing that we just learned, like maybe the trauma that you just learned, you might not, never be able to, if you keep playing those loud sounds during REM sleep, depotentiate and, and silence the things once it's consolidated. So I don't recommend necessarily doing that until we know more um, with basic research. Great question. Okay, there's a, a question I'd really like to get to here, which is about oversleeping. So oh. what's the disadvantage of oversleeping? And, yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I, I might get in trouble for this, but I don't think you can oversleep. I think that your body will get as much sleep as it needs. And um, if you wake up feeling really terrible um, because you feel like you've overslept, try going back to sleep and waking up again, <laughs> if you have time, if you have time for it. Because if you wake up out of um, REM sleep, you actually feel refreshed and ready for the day, energetic. If you wake up out of deep slow wave sleep, you, you have something called sleep inertia. And so it might not be oversleeping so much as um, as getting, waking up out of the wrong stage of sleep. So just try going back to sleep and see how you wake up, how you feel when you wake up the next time. Um, it might be that you were just in, you had so little sleep the week before that you're having some of that deep slow wave sleep in the wee hours of the morning or the late hours of the morning when you normally wouldn't be in deep slow wave sleep at all, but because it had, your need for it built up so much, you're waking up out of that, your, your circadian system and your sleep homeostatic system are sort of at odds with one another because you are trying to make up for, for lost sleep. So the first thing I would do is, you know, try and, you know, throw your alarm out so you wake up naturally if you possibly can and, um, and go to bed early enough that you will naturally arouse out of the right state of sleep and do that consistently so you don't build up the sleep pressure that would cause the various sleep stages to clash and overlap and, and make you not feel so great when you're waking up. So there was one study when they had people lying in bed in a dimly lit room with absolutely nothing else to do for 12 hours a day for a month, every day, 12 hours a day for a month. And um, initially people slept a lot more than they did um, other times. They slept 10 or 11 hours a night in the first few nights. And then eventually uh, they evened out to an average of eight hours and 15 minutes uh, of sleep. And the rest of the time they were awake, twiddling in their thumbs, humming to themselves, uh, probably daydreaming. Um, they didn't, they can't, you can't just sleep um, interminably, even if there's nothing else to do. So I think just one final very quick question, which probably doesn't have a quick answer, but that could have a quick answer, is <laughs> what's the relationship between um, sleep deprivation and weight gain? Oh, right. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, hmm. So, so metabolism is something that's well regulated by sleep, especially um, sleep that is at the right circadian time. And what the circadian rhythm does, it's a, you know, or the clock in our all of our bodies, all of the cells in our body. It helps coordinate the timing of everything and including sleep and sleep states. So if you're sleeping um, too little and not at the right time, um, 
our metabolism, our metabolic system, which is supposed to be restored and um, renormalized during sleep, isn't able to do that. And so, like I said before, when I stay up too late, I get hungry for junk food. And um, if I get hungry for junk food, then I'm not eating properly. And um, it happens in rats too. If you sleep deprive them, they will start eating the fattiest, sugariest foods available. And, um, and, um, and that's not good for your know, diabetes and your whole system. So um, also another thing that happens when we're sleep deprived is our prefrontal cortex, which is off throughout sleep, except for during this sleep spindles, um, that, that isn't able to get whatever restorative function it needs. And, um, and so our judgment and decision-making go out the window. And so if you give a sleep deprived person a choice between healthy salads, which they say they like to eat versus cake, they will much more often go for the cake after they've been sleep deprived and they have much less ability to inhibit their, um, their desires like that. So that could also be another reason why people tend to gain weight if they're getting too little sleep. Well, thank you very much indeed, Gina. You've clearly stimulated a huge amount of interest. And I know I'm certainly going to go away thinking about that jellyfish this weekend, <laughs> which was a, a, re a real surprise. So th thank you again for giving that superb lecture. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here and nice to be here with all of you. And maybe we can save the chat so that I can look at these questions and answer more of them later. I don't know how that could work, but we can certainly do that. Okay. That would be fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you.